The North Atlantic upper airspace is divided into six control sectors. Up here, we have Reykjavik Oceanic and Bode Oceanic, controlled by Norway. In the middle, we have the two most important sectors, Gander Oceanic, controlled by Canada, and Shanwick, controlled by Ireland and the UK. The name Shanwick is in fact a combination of the formerly responsible control areas of Shannon and Prestwick. Lastly, down here are New York Oceanic, of course controlled by the US, and Santa Maria Oceanic, which is controlled from the Azores Island, located down here in the Atlantic. As I said before, the control centers of Shanwick and Gander are the most important ones, since they handle the bulk of the traffic between the US and Europe. Each day, they handle a vast number of planes that usually depart around the same time. Mostly, flights will depart Europe around the later hours of the morning or around lunchtime to arrive in the US in the afternoon. On the other hand, flights in the US will generally depart towards the evening hours in order to arrive in Europe early in the morning. This creates two waves of traffic that need to be handled efficiently. There is just one problem. Usually, most flights would like to take pretty similar routes. This is due to a very strong band of wind called the polar jet stream. It blows in varying strength but in a fixed direction, always from west to east. Therefore, in order to benefit from these nice tailwinds, all flights from the US would like to fly at the core of this jet stream to get to Europe faster, therefore also burning less fuel. On the other hand, flights from Europe would like to avoid the jet stream altogether, while not deviating from their ideal route too far. This usually leaves two desired corridors, one westward and one eastward. But remember, we are talking about a route over an ocean here, where there is no radar. For that scenario, more separation is needed. Therefore, the control centers of Shanwick and Gander create a whole array of tracks for airlines to use each day. One day before a flight intends to cross the Atlantic, airlines have the opportunity to file their preferred routes with the control centers. The centers then publish the so-called track message, in which they publish a set of tracks that planes can use to cross the ocean. The westbound track system consists of multiple tracks named A, B, C, D and so on. It is usually active from around lunchtime to the early evening hours in Europe when the bulk of flights heads west. Later, in the early evening hours in the US, the eastbound track system is activated, consisting of tracks named C, Y, X and so on. All tracks, regardless of whether they are west or eastbound, consist of one of various fixed North Atlantic entry and exit points with various waypoints in between. The middle part of the route changes every day. There, waypoints are not used in the conventional way, but coordinates are specified at every 10 degrees of longitude. An example track, let's call it track Bravo, could look like this. It begins at waypoint Limri, then crosses the coordinates of 51 north and 20 degrees west, 49 degrees north, 30 degrees west, 46 degrees north, 40 degrees west, 45 degrees north, 50 degrees west, and ends in Canadian airspace at a waypoint called Raffin. Airlines can choose which track they prefer and file that route in their flight plan. Upon reaching the respective North Atlantic entry point, the previous air traffic controller will hand the flight off to Oceanic Control. From now on, there will no longer be any radar control or VHF communications. Planes will just fly at the altitude and speed they were assigned to, maintaining separation to one another that way. In the early days, pilots would have to report their position at every 10 degrees of longitude, so controllers could intervene if separation between two aircraft would against all expectations be lost. This was done using HF radio, a pretty ancient radio technology that uses radio waves that bounce between the Earth's surface and certain layers of the atmosphere. As you would expect from such a technology, its audio quality is pretty horrible. Listen for yourself. Fortunately, this is not the case anymore. Thanks to satellite communications and surveillance, things are a lot easier today. Planes send their exact position to the oceanic control centers every few seconds via satellite, which makes an exact tracking so much easier. This is also the reason why you can see planes on flight radar while they are crossing the ocean. HF radio is still used, but only as a backup. When crossing into the first, or from one oceanic control center to the next, it has to be checked. Hello, we're at 2627 Heavy. Proceed to check in and they will be next. Hello, we're at 2627 Sound Radio. Good evening. Secondary HF with Sandwich 5649er. Three 
Zero West, contact Gander Radio. Eight eight nine zero one. Secondary five six one six. Okay, positive circle check. Back in at frequency with you. Five six four nine er and a thirty West. Eight eight nine one. Back at five six one six. Okay, two six two seven. Have a good evening. The advent of GPS and other technologies have made much tighter separation between aircraft possible. Now, with separations this close and no direct control from a radar station, you might be wondering, what if something goes wrong? What if a plane suffers an engine failure, a fire or decompression, or something else that requires a rapid descent? Luckily, the designers of the North Atlantic track system even thought of that. To give pilots an easy way out, there is a North Atlantic contingency procedure. First, in an emergency, pilots should always attempt to obtain a clearance for a deviation of their route. If that is not possible and an immediate intervention is needed, pilots may exit the track system by turning right or left by at least 30 degrees and then flying offset from the original track by 5 miles. From this position, pilots may descend on a parallel track to an altitude below the organized track system, which typically reaches down to 29,000 feet. There, pilots may exit the track system and tend to their emergency, 